Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Harkey. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. This is Transferring Cyber Risk, Cyber Insurance, the questions you should ask. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the GoToWebinar chat and or raise your hand. I will make sure they get answered by Dan or myself. I will also be chatting the links mentioned by myself or Dan in that same window. Thanks for the feedback. We are recording and offering these webinars. It takes about a month. The last webinar, How to Review a SOC 1 or 2, is up. You can find it at my.infotex.com slash SSAE16-16 SSAE-16 underscore movie. Again, based on your feedback, we are using GoToWebinar now, so please forgive our growing pains. For those of you who are MSSP clients, we are working on providing assistance on the CATS baseline requirements for quarterly firewall re rules review and hope to have word to you by October 1st. We are giving away another SOC 1 or 2 review this webinar. You must be present when we draw towards the end of the webinar to win. That's a $600 value of $400 for Infotex clients. This is the ninth stop in our 2016 IT governance tour. Our next four webinars have been announced, with the next webinar being August 23rd at 9 a.m., covering awareness in all directions. Dan has a NECUL workshop on incident response and the cyber assessment tool on September 22nd at 9 a.m. All credit unions and banks are welcome to attend. This is not free, but recommended. Again, I've chatted these links. So on to our main event. Many of you already know Dan as a moderator of the Fall Information Security Conference for the Indiana Bankers Association. He runs our company, Infotex, which is a managed security services firm as well as an IT audit firm. He has 13 letters after his name, and they're all about information security, the awareness guru from Indiana, and his spreadsheets are legendary. Dan? Thank you very much, Michael, and uh, good morning, everybody. I guess I just want to start with a shout-out to Michelle. Uh, she knows who she is. Uh, she couldn't make the webinar but was asking about her movie, so now if she doesn't say anything about this shout-out, I'll know that she didn't watch the movie. Anyway, uh, we've got uh, quite a bit of material to cover once again. I, I usually try to get this done in an hour, but uh, the last couple webinars went about five, ten minutes over. Uh, especially if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, um, you know, it might extend the length of the webinar. Uh, we want to talk about risk management and how, you know, we arrive at the notion of transferring risk. And then I really want to kind of zoom in and drill down on cybersecurity or, you know, cybersecurity insurance or cyber insurance or whatever it should be called. Um, and, and so I'm using kind of some horror stories and such to, uh, you know, establish that notion. And then finally, where this whole webinar is, is arriving or is, is heading is to the notion of, you know, what questions should we be asking our insurance providers as we analyze the insurance that we have and, and really as we analyze how we're going about transferring technology risk. To start, I really need to really kind of go to the caveat, uh, which is that I am not, and Infotex is certainly not, a company that claims expertise on insurance. Uh, we're actually an MSSP. Um, you know, you might have heard Michael, you know, refer to our MSSP clients in the introduction, and uh, that stands for Managed Security Service Provider. Uh, what we do is we watch bank networks and that sort of thing, and so uh, we also audit a lot of banks. And while we're auditing banks, uh, we're asked a lot of questions about cyber insurance these days. And we've kind of learned to ask a lot of questions about cyber insurance as well. So I'm kind of the Columbo of cyber insurance, if you're old enough to, to remember that uh, uh, you know, TV program. Um, I ask a lot of questions. I really don't know what the right answers are supposed to be at often, uh, but I have created a set of questions that you should be asking your insurance providers to make sure that uh, you don't end up with a false sense of security. Um, so just to kind of back away from the trees to see the forest, uh, let's just talk briefly about what we mean when we say technology risk management. And I, 
I can boil it all down to three activities. First, you know, we need to measure the risk that we're exposed to because uh, our customers trust us with information that if it was breached could cause a lot of harm for our customers. Um, and, and then once we've measured that risk, we need to determine how to respond to what we find when we're measuring it. And so if the residual risk uh, is too high, we might want to mitigate that risk or whatever. And, and we call that risk response. And then finally, we monitor the risk, both uh, in real time, you know, again, as an MSSP, we watch bank networks, but also, you know, the incident response team is kind of uh, arising as the key mechanism, and I've given a lot of webinars and, and workshops about incident response, and so if you've been attending my workshops and webinars, you know exactly what my, I mean when I say that we need to monitor for both non-technical and technical risk. And so if we drill in on that second process, the response process, uh, what we're really talking about is some choices that we have uh, when we respond to risk. And there's more than three choices, but the primary choices are uh, we need to either lower the risk or mitigate the risk uh, by installing controls usually, um, or we can accept the risk, meaning that, hey, you know what, the, the reward, um, the risk mitigation uh, just does not warrant the expense of the controls, and therefore we want to accept that risk. Now, um, if we're accepting risk, we really want to monitor the risk that we're accepting, and that's kind of one of the big you know, most important points of a risk monitoring program. Uh, but ultimately, we can also maybe transfer some of that accepted risk to a third party. And, and when we transfer risk, we can do it in, in, in many different ways. But the two primary methods are, A, we outsource the process. And so you're transferring a lot of risk when you have somebody do your online banking for you, as an example. We're outsourcing our online banking websites to an online banking pro provider, and therefore we transfer some of that risk over to that provider. Ultimately, we're still responsible, but we're still transferring some of that risk. And then finally, I think the reason why most people are here is because we can also then use insurance products to help us transfer risk. And really, we're, we're, we're transferring four primary risk categories when we do purchase insurance, uh, starting with any damages to third parties, uh, most of the insurance policies, et cetera. You know, my research in insurance has, has summarized that as liability, um, property losses, or, in, or, or our internal costs. Um, and then I've broken out, I mean, property loss could include the cost of incident management um, and reputation. I've broken these two items out because I feel like this is a huge part of cyber insurance is to help us with the cost of managing an incident as well as helping um, rebuild our reputation. Or if we're lucky, and if you've come to my workshops and webinars about incident response, you'll know I'm a big believer that we can actually take an incident and turn it around to make our company look even better than we looked before the incident if we do a good job of preparation and response. And so the value of cyber insurance is that it, it acts as a risk transfer mechanism. It allows us to kind of combine different approaches to insurance uh, so that we can assist in the incident management response. And then finally, um, especially for the non-regulated industries, and I am starting to pick up quite a few clients that were shaken by the parade of breach news in 2013 and 14 and became clients of Infotex even though they're not banks, credit unions, or hospitals. Uh, because they were getting insurance and they wanted to make sure that they had the right practices in place because they were telling insurance companies that they were had certain controls in place. Um, cyber insurance has become more and more popular, uh, primarily because your regular insurance does not cover breaches. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about uh, um, um, coverages and, and exclusions in this webinar, uh, but uh, just you know, let's suffice it to say that the only person I know that's happy with the Sue Happy culture um, is my sister, whose name is Sue, and so she always says, hey, we're a Sue Happy culture. Um, and so, you know, obviously uh, she's not getting that. Um, we also have some risk when it comes to risk transference, and that's really why I'm putting on this webinar. It's because I feel like a lot of my clients have ended up with a false sense of security that 
uh, that, that when I come in and I do an incident response test, for an example, uh, the, the team that I test, usually the incident response team, will, will make declarations during the test. Well, we've got that covered. We have insurance. They'll cover this. They'll cover that. And so in the follow-up to the test, I always ask them to, you know, ask those difficult questions of their insurance providers to make sure that they really did have that coverage, and very often they did. And we'll be talking about that when we get to the section called the horror of it all. Um, meanwhile, are we required by regulation to transfer risk? And uh, recently, uh, we actually saw some guidance. Um, if you remember, um, in late 2015, and in, in December of 2015, they updated the management booklet. Uh, Mike should be making a copy of that available to you on your uh, uh, go-to webinar panel right now. Uh, but if you just flip to page 32 when you pull that baby down and start analyzing it, you'll see that they actually did for the first time uh, speak to the subject of insurance. Uh, I'm not going to read all this to you. I'll kind of go over the highlights with you. But you can see that they've actually uh, uh, got a good page uh, and a half worth of information about insurance in that guidance. And so I already showed you the guidance. But um, to me, one of the main provisions is kind of telling about our examiners uh, when you read that guidance, what you'll find is that the tone of it is, well, yeah, if you don't want to install the controls, you can, you know, use insurance as part of your mitigation strategy. Now, you know, I find it interesting because insurance is really part of a transfer strategy. Uh, but what they're really saying there is that you can transfer some of the risk. They're, they're giving us some permission uh, to use insurance, uh, but they then go so far as to il illustrate and articulate what I'm really trying to uh, uh, establish today, which is, boy, you better make sure you understand your insurance needs, and then you better make sure you understand how your insurance programs as a totality um, do and do not meet those needs. And we don't need to meet all of our insurance needs, but we need to be aware of when our insurance does fall short of those needs so that we don't proceed with a false sense of security. Um, the guidance also basically says that management, and you know who they mean by management, is you know up to our um, uh, uh, policies to define if we do a good job of writing our policies and procedures. But they basically want managers to understand and recognize the exposures to loss, the coverages, and then how much our insurance is costing, and really that risk reward factor. You know, is it really worth? Um, paying to be able to inform up to 50,000 people if we're a small community-based bank and we only have 2,000 customers, as an example. Um, and what we would like to see established is, and, and you know, Michael, I, I know he's going to be sending kind of a poll uh, to see, you know, who in your bank is responsible for the, the insurance decisions, but I'm going to be making the case in this webinar that we should include the incident response team in the process of analyzing your insurance. Um, and so um, the guidance kind of gives me coverage on that a little bit because, you know, we do need to define what we mean by management. And so um, finally, you know, word for word, an overall appraisal of the control environment is important in assessing the adequacy of the risk program. You know, what I really mean by that is, you know, let's get our risk assessments out. Hopefully your risk assessments are allowing you to identify where you are accepting risk and you should be able to make that easy because you should be able to go to your board minutes and see in your board minutes where you've educated the board that we are accepting this risk. And then when we review our insurance application or our, our insurance packages, um, we want to make sure that we understand where we are transferring that risk and where we might be able to transfer some of that risk, at least the impact of the risk. And, and, and if we go back to the beginning, back away from the trees to see the forest, what I mean is that when we transfer risk, we are not lowering the likelihood that a threat could exploit the vulnerability. What we're lowering is the impact if the threat did exploit the vulnerability and up until the advent of cyber insurance, what, we're, what we were lowering, if we lowered the impact at all, is we were only lowering the financial impact. In other words, if they could sneak it under the fraud provisions or if they could sneak it under the network security provisions of your policy and you had a good insurance company that wasn't trying to weasel out of anything or you had smaller claims and they were just 
you know, taking advantage of your high deductibles or whatever, um, you are only lowering the financial impact. And so what cyber insurance will help us with is lower some of the other impacts, including reputational impact, as I had established before. So uh, management should clearly understand what is covered and then document any gaps in coverage. And that really is the ultimate purpose of this webinar. The way we're going to document the gaps is by risk ranking the answers to the questions that we may or may not ask our insurance providers. There's also a big bank provision in there. As, you know, you can choose to self-insure against certain losses. Um, you could also kind of reword that for smaller banks to say that there are going to be certain cases where you decide you don't want to spring for the cost of the insurance because maybe you think the likelihood of the particular accepted risk is low. Maybe it's one of those black swan things where, you know, uh, you, you don't really think it's going to happen, but it's in your insurance, I mean, in your risk assessment, because if it did happen, it would cause, you know, a very large impact on a scale of one to six. Um, some of my clients have said, well, that should be the stuff we do insure, and my answer to that is, you know, I'm an IT guy, I'm a, I'm a technology risk management guy, those types of financial decisions are hopefully where your, your normal insurance analysts are going to be able to help you. Uh, but then finally, that guidance articulates that you must consider the exclusions, and then it goes into, I mean, the whole last part of that guidance, if you look at that, um, you know, it is just the types of risks, and we're going to be talking about this a little bit here um, as we get through this webinar. And so now what I'd like to do is just kind of, um, you know, talk about the horror stories that I have that hopefully will motivate you to do an insurance review and to involve your ins um, incident response team on insurance review. Um, and so, you know, I'm just going to start off with a few horror stories and then, you know, kind of drill down on the types of insurance. Um, the main reason why cyber insurance is important is because most of your traditional insurance applications, um, or I should say insurance products, um, I'd say probably starting about 2005 or so, uh, put in an exclusion for what we now call cyber events. And then finally, I want to end with a six-step process uh, for doing and implementing an insurance review. Um, before we get too far, though, Mike, can you go ahead and trigger that first poll? And uh, if, if you're wondering what I mean, if you go to the poll section of your uh, uh, GoToWebinar uh, you know, council there. Uh, you can see that Mike's got a uh, question. Hopefully, you'll feel comfortable. I mean, we're not going to share the results with anybody other than the people at this webinar, um, and and I don't think we're going to even keep the individual results. We're just going to keep the totality. Uh, but while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and start with a few horror stories uh, that I've kind of picked up over the years. Starting with, and, and I haven't seen this one with any of my clients, but I. Uh, when I first started getting interested in technology risk management and insurance, I, as it, you know, I mean, I've been interested in technology risk management since the 80s, but what I mean is that when I heard about this, I was like, you know what, maybe we should start asking about insurance when we audit our banks. And so, you know, let's face it, you know, we don't know where an attack is going to come from. And so the people back in the early 2000s that bought Chinese hacker insurance, and, and by the way, this was mainly from outside of our country. Fortunately, we have laws that hopefully would prevent somebody from selling you Chinese hacker insurance. But, you know, it's kind of outrageous what they were doing there. They were, they were making you prove that the attack came from China. Um, I don't even know if that's true, by the way. It was just something I started hearing about. I uh, probably should have went to Snopes.com. But, but it, it makes a good horror story anyway to introduce the horror stories because there's a lot of reasons why you need to think it through and make sure you're not just buying what your insurance rep is selling you. Um, this next horror story, uh, you know, I mean, is kind of uh, more what I have actually seen and heard of and read about, and that is that your insurance policy, if you read it, you know, word for word, may only, you know, pay for um, what the law requires. And so the law isn't going to require us to use more than one vehicle to notify our customers. The law basically gives us some choices. And if we decide we want to mail our customers and maybe also do some advertising as part of turning that lemon into lemonade, and those of you who haven't been to my workshops, don't worry, I under, I'm used to you raising your eyebrows. Why would we want to advertise if there's a breach? But if we did make that decision, your insurance company might only pay for the letter. Or 
Uh, there are a lot of cases where uh, my clients have decided, you know what, in this case we probably fall on the side of not having to notify our customers, uh, but let's go ahead and notify at least our top customers anyway because I'd rather them hear it from us. Um, and so they did the right thing and then they found out that their insurance company wouldn't cover those costs uh, because the law didn't require them to do that. Um, I've seen this as I've uh, reviewed insurance policies for banks where uh, if it's known malware, uh, there's either a higher deductible or there's a limit on what's paid or it's not covered at all um, compared to malware that's you know, not in the databases of known malware. And, and so the theory there is, is that you're supposed to have good antivirus in place in order to get this insurance. So, you know, if there's uh, known malware that causes a breach, uh, we shouldn't have to pay as much. And, and you know, that's kind of a, a nice way to lower the insurance company's financial risk. Uh, but it doesn't really recognize the true nature of security risk. You, you can have a really good information security posture and still end up with known malware on your system. Um, Target is a great example of why we need to, you know, re review insurance policies and be realistic about what the cost of a breach is. And, and you know, right now it's about $265 per record, just so you know. Um, and so when Target lost those 80 million records, that 2013 breach that made them famous, uh, they reported $61 million in costs but the insurance only covered 40 million. And so I can just kind of imagine someone in the boardroom somewhere was like, it'll never cost us more than $40 million for an incident. Let's cap our insurance at 40 million. And I think they probably regret that mistake to the tune of at least $21 million. So um, Sony, uh, uh, you know, we all probably remember the breach that was widely reported back in 2014. Well, it actually started due to a data breach in 2011. And um, if you look closely at your insurance policies, what you'll realize is that it's the policy that you had in place the date of the breach. And, and in 2011, Sony had since updated their policies, but in 2011, the policy was goofy because it only covered actions by Sony employees and not third parties like North Korea. Um, I have a client that the reason they engaged with us is because they were acquiring cyber insurance and, uh, you know, was very proud of their cyber insurance package, uh, but they had a social engineering attack that cost them quite a bit of money. Damn. And, Damn. Yeah? Sorry to interrupt, but it's not even 10 yet. Can we cool up with all the scary stories? I'm feeling frightened, not enlightened. Okay. Okay. Well, that's fine. I guess we can cool it. It's kind of too bad, though, because I was planning on giving a million dollars away to the person that got the answer to this. Uh, last question, right? But all right, all right. I'll carry we'll on, on. Carry on then. No, no, no. We'll, we'll move on. We'll move on. Um, uh, the point I'm trying to make with all these horror stories, though, is that no two insurance packages are alike. You know, even with the same company. And really, what needs to happen is that we need to get our arms around what our insurance does cover, so that we're not doing that during an information security incident. Um, and so I see insurance as overlapping into incident response. And, if, and, and, and so if you see incident response as the overlap of risk management, business continuity, and awareness training, what we're really talking about here is that we need to become aware of how we're transferring risk and what our insurance covers so that when we uh, are, are in the middle of an incident, we do want to know that, hey, the insurance company will cover the forensics, but they're not going to cover notifying customers above X number of customers or, or, or whatever. And so we need to have an insurance policy review process in place that, you know, I feel should at least be uh, um, integrated in with the incident response program, if not a part of the incident response preparation. So. Let's just kind of back up a little bit and talk about the three types of commercial insurance that are available on the marketplace, um, have always been available. When I say always, you know, at least since I've been in business, and I first started my first business in uh, the late 1970s. And so we had property insurance, liability insurance, and workers' comp. And so in the area of property insurance, what we're talking about there is damages to ourselves. When we talk about liability insurance, we're talking about damages to other people. And so 
Those of you who have, you know, an old car, uh, you might only have liability insurance on that car because, you know, if something happens to it, it's not like you're going to, you know, go out and replace it or whatever. So you only get liability because you only want to cover damage to third parties, whereas if you have a brand new car, you might want to get property and liability because you don't want to cough up the, you know, twenty to fifty thousand dollars, all depending on what kind of car you have, it would take to replace your new car. And so technology risk transference, of course, needs to combine both of those approaches. Um, and so, you know, because of that, um, we want to really look at uh, and, and by the way, the insurance packages that I've seen usually talk about uh, property damage as first party coverage and then, you know, what the damages would be to our customers in an incident, they call that third party coverage. And so cyber insurance has kind of evolved to be able to bridge, you know, and, and, and offer both property and liability coverage for the sake of responding to information security incidents. There's four different types of cyber insurance that I've seen and have kind of found in my research, uh, starting with multimedia liability insurance. Uh, that really is um, coverage that addresses the defacement of your websites or somebody stealing your intellectual property rights. Um, it's probably not necessary for your bank, though, you know, if you spend a lot of money and time branding or you have a lot of trademarks or whatever, maybe you would value multimedia liability insurance. But what I would do is make a note to, you know, if you're a vendor management person, you know, maybe you should be checking on your online banking provider to see what type of insurance they have and I bet you will see multimedia liability in their insurance packages if they sent you all of their uh, certificates. Um, extortion liability is becoming more and more popular now because, you know, for larger institutions, of course, they still um, are, are, you know, threatened by distributed denial of service attacks, usually by anonymous or other, you know, hacker um, groups or hacktivist groups or whatever. But you know, if you're afraid of ransomware, one of the ways you can transfer the risk of recovering lost information or whatever would be with extortion liability insurance. Um, network security, a lot of us thought we were covered when we bought our network security packages. Um, it does, you know, cover liabilities associated with denial of service and third-party data theft, uh, but boy, this ends up becoming a gray area here, and if you have network security, I would definitely walk through that six step review process to see what it does and doesn't cover. Which brings us to really what most banks and, and, and credit unions and hospitals and, and you know, managed security service providers, et cetera, are, are acquiring at this time. Um, and, and what we're probably, you know, what most people are thinking about when they talk about cyber insurance and that data breach or privacy management insurance that, that not only covers the liabilities or maybe has a, a network security security component that covers the liabilities, but it also covers property damages or, you know, the internal costs related to the investigation, um, related to, you know, what kind of data is involved here, credit monitoring fees if we want to offer that to our victims, um, and then, of course, associated legal fees. And, uh, you know, and an IT insurance analysis, we want to really take a look at what we're covered by all of our insurance policies. You know, our network security might not cover internal malicious activity by our employees, but our regular umbrella policy does cover m employee mischief. Um, our, you know, data privacy policy might not cover social engineering, but our network security policy covers social engineering or whatever. So what I encourage uh, my clients to do is to, is to really, and it, and it gets difficult if you're sharing insurance with more than one company because you're going to have to decide, well, which question should we ask of which provider? Uh, but what we really want to see is what our insurance policies as a whole are covering and what they're not covering. And we should really start with our risk assessment and that I believe at least the deliverables of this process should be delivered to the incident response team um, rather than, you know, just filed away in some kind of a file. And so, A, once you're finished with your risk assessment, hopefully it already identifies accepted risks, uh, but if not, your auditor will probably be talking to you about that over the course of the next couple of years. And once you get it to the ability to identify accepted risks, 
Um, and you've already escalated those to the board and made sure the board understand the risks that the management team is accepting on their behalf. Let's add that into our question list. So if we say, hey, you know, we don't have our exchange server in a DMZ because, you know, of this, this, and this, but an auditor decided that they thought you should move it to a DMZ and we decided we didn't want to do that. Well, that's something that would be escalated to the board, um, but we also then would maybe want to ask the questions that arise out of that um, when it comes to our insurance provider, uh, which could be just as simple as, we don't have our exchange server in a DMZ, would, you know, your in policy cover any kind of breach that arises out of that issue? Um, now, that's getting a little bit pointed, a little bit specific, uh, but you'll see what I mean by all that when we get to the last part of uh, um, this uh, six-step process. But ultimately, we want to develop a question list. Uh, we certainly don't want to send our insurance agents the number of questions that I have that you could ask. Um, and so we're going to probably risk rank our question list um, right off the bat so that we can whittle it down to the questions we really want our insurance agent to answer um, and then send them that list Meet, give them some time to answer those questions, meet with them, and then when they're answering the questions, ask them where is it in the policy that this particular question is covered. From that point, then, we want to document the exclusions, you know, go back, circle back around to our insurance coverage person and say, hey, you know, is there, you know, the insurance agent mentioned that if we, if we bought the data breach or the privacy insurance or whatever you want to call it, they would pay for, you know, the expense of, providing credit monitoring if there is an incident. We'd like to add that in because we feel like that'll really help our reputational risk and then acquire more coverage if that is necessary. Um, but at the end of the process, we definitely want to document some key metrics in our incident response plan. And, and that could just be as simple. Um, this is a boilerplate to our incident response plan here. I, I hope it's easy to read there. I, I, I think I might be able to make it just a little bit bigger here. Um, so I probably should have done this, you know, before our meeting. Sorry about that. Let's go up to maybe 160%. Um, but, and then, and then really where I'm heading with this is that uh, we have a section in our incident response plan. And by the way, if you were at our last uh, workshop, email me asking for this because this is not um, in uh, the incident response plan. Uh, but basically what it's saying is that we should conduct a risk assessment on our insurance. And then uh, we should document the key metrics that uh, are a result of the insurance review. And then for the larger banks, it actually spells out that six-step process I just went over in that one slide in more policy-type lingo, not, you know, your plan or whatever. But um, this is probably something that I would say, you know, any bank over, you know, six, seven hundred million might want to consider adding to their incident response plan. Uh, those smaller banks, you ought to at least pull in the key metrics into your incident response plan. And the main reason why I suggest that is because when I test banks, ultimately the question comes up, you know, um, does our insurance company cover, you know, this or that, or what's the deductible? You know, if it's going to be less than the deductible, let's not even have the conversation about insurance, you know, that sort of thing. So um, that is the deliverable. I'm thinking Mike's probably already uh, um, you know, sent you that uh, particular document so that you can uh, integrate that into your existing IT, uh, uh, I mean, your incident response program. So where I'm heading with the last part of this webinar now then is what questions should we be asking? And so real quick, I'm just going to, uh, Mike, if you wouldn't mind uh, triggering that next poll. And um, uh, are there results from the previous poll, or did uh, nobody answer, or uh, what, what are we looking at with that previous poll? And, and, and please read the question as well as the results so I can remember what the question was. Um, I can actually share it with everybody. Um, I'm going to do that now, uh, and I'll read it out to you. I'm not sure what you can see there. What type of insurance does your institution currently have? 17% said a cyber insurance policy. 50% uh, said umbrella fraud, theft, with no specific breach coverage. 33% uh, said not sure. 0% okay. said other. And so I'm thinking that out of all of that, I mean, 17% cyber insurance, 50% uh, umbrella, 33% not sure, I would say that 100% of you 
should do the insurance review because even those of you who said yes I have cyber insurance and you probably are like all right all right yeah I have cyber insurance you know I, I can answer that um, so that 17 percent of you that said you have cyber insurance really what type of cyber insurance do you have does it cover you know um, uh, 2,000 people or does it cover 50,000 people and how many people do you really need to have it cover and that sort of thing and so um, from a high, thank you, Michael. Uh, from a high level, uh, I guess the first question I would ask is, you know, who's responsible for it, and does that person feel comfortable about cyber insurance? Um, you know, should there be a review of that person's elections when it comes to cyber insurance? Uh, another very high level question you should be asking is, you know, how do we approve our insurance? You know, is it is it just the the CFO, I'm seeing the results of the, the last poll. I'm not sure if um, it's, I'm allowed to, uh, I mean, are, are, there, are we done with that yet, Mike? Or should I, hope? I guess 70% voted, so we'll wait for the rest of them to vote there. Um, but, you know, what it's looking like right now is most banks um, are having either a CFO or their president uh, handle the insurance. So I'm thinking, you know, we're probably talking, you know, community-based banks here. Uh, we do have a few that are saying not sure yet. Uh, but you know, we want to try to get to the bottom of that or else we're not going to have, um, or, or I should say, or else we're going to have a false sense of security at the worst possible time. The last time we want to be proceeding on myth instead of facts is when we're in the middle of that, you know, career-threatening incident. Um, the next question is, you know, what should be documented about our insurance in our incident response plan? What, what will we need to know about in our incident response plan? You know, the obvious ones are deductibles and what they cover, the coverages. Uh, but there might be some idiosyncrasies in your insurance plan that you need to know about. For an example, if you don't notify us within, you know, 48 hours of the incident, you're not covered. Well, boy, I'd like to know you that going into an incident so that we can make a decision during the triage process. Let's notify our insurance company about this. Um, you know, that type of thing we want to find out. Um, and document in our insurance, I mean, our incident response plan. Um, of course, the coverages are important, but more important is what does it not cover? And it's okay, again, if we don't cover something, but we need to go into an incident with our eyes wide open knowing what those exclusions are. Um, moving further into, you know, preparation, what risks are we accepting and does our insurance policy cover the vulnerabilities that arise from those risks. And so if we have a particular risk that we're accepting, ultimately that's because we are missing a control or we can't afford a control or we're not aware of any controls and, you know, or we might have purchased some controls and we still haven't rolled them out yet or whatever. And so does our insurance policy recognize the, a threat exploiting those vulnerabilities as a coverable expense. And a lot easier said than done, uh, but I've, I'm heading towards a nice little uh, first iteration, but a nice little uh, template that you'll be able to use to kind of answer and document the answers to these questions. Uh, of course, you know, the standard questions that we would normally ask in an insurance, you know, when we buy, you know, health insurance, when we buy life insurance, when we, you know, I, I, I think there's only one incident, by the way, when it comes to life insurance, I would hope. Um, well, actually, I guess I don't know if I would hope or not, but, you know, when it comes to any kind of insurance, you know, we need to know what the coverage is, what's the max, where are they going to cut us off? Um, and then, of course, what are our deductibles and, and what are our exclusions? And so, because cyber insurance really, you know, and, and maybe we shouldn't say cyber insurance, maybe we should say technology risk transference covers many different aspects that, that are usually handled by many different insurance products. And also because we're not really insurance experts. And even our CFOs that I, you know, interview during an audit, they're, they're, they're going to say, hey, now, I'm not the expert on this. So, you know, I mean, if you ask me a question, I don't know the answer to, but we're going to have to get our, you know, insurance agent here. And, and just so you know, a lot of the questions we ask, our insurance agents aren't experts at yet. And they, you know, have places where they can do research. And they're very careful about how they answer their questions, which is really why we want to whittle the questions down to what we think is pertinent, pertinent questions. Um, and so, uh, Mike, uh, if you want to go ahead and uh, provide that spreadsheet to everybody. But, 
you know, I'm a, you know, a spreadsheet kind of guy, right? And so uh, we've created this spreadsheet, and, and I did already, you know, uh, make this nice and big. But if you look over here, you'll see that we give you the ability to risk rank uh, the answers or maybe risk rank the questions going in. Um, there's an ability to document the exclusions or those idiosyncrasies, those nuances, such as you have to notify the insurance company within 48 hours of the breach um, or of you discovering the breach, at least, in order to be covered, that sort of thing. We want to document that. And so how do we go about doing that? Well, you know, we, you know, um, have provided this list of all these questions to you. Um, notice how it refers to collections of policies. And so if you're working with one insurance provider, that's going to be a lot easier than if you're splitting your insurance from two between two or three different companies. Um, somebody's going to have to do the work of deciding which company should be asked which questions. Uh, we've categorized all the questions in terms of, you know, um, this last one I'll get to a little bit, but, you know, is this a question about our coverage? Is this question about the types of data that are coverage? And then is this question more about process? Uh, there shouldn't be any blanks in there, so let me at least pull down to those to see which ones I uh, um, didn't hit when I was going through categorizing these. And again, that kind of helps. Oh, okay, good, there's none. Um, I just realized we have these over here. Um, that's left over from the template that I borrowed this from. I'm not sure if these metrics will work at all uh, for insurance, and when you're using this, you might want to just go ahead and completely delete this part here. Um, but like I was saying, this is, I'm going to leave it in there in case it does apply, um, or can be moderated to, you know, apply. Uh, but the point is, is that this is the first iteration of this list of questions. Uh, most of these questions actually come from our audit process. And so when we audited banks over the last year or so, uh, we'd go in there and we'd ask a bunch of questions to see how well they've reviewed their insurance policy. And, and quite frankly, if they knew the answers to these questions already, we'd say, okay, good, they don't really, you know, they, they've done a good job of thinking things through. Uh, but if they're looking at us like a deer in headlights or they're like, I don't know, we'll have to talk to our insurance agent, you know, we'll, we'll give them the list of questions and say, okay, well, you know, this doesn't rise to the level of being reportable because, you know, I mean, we, we don't have any good solid, you know, guidance that requires this, but you might want to ask these questions so that you go into your incident response uh, with your eyes wide open. Um, but the point is, is that, well, and that was the point. This is the first iteration you know, I expect probably about a year from now that we'll have many other iterations. I mean, this is such an early iteration that doesn't even include the boilerplate on it. So I don't know if you, you know, you've seen any of our workshops uh, before or any of our boilerplates, but we usually have, you know, a lot more information in, in these documents than this. Um, I actually just kind of pulled this together for this webinar uh, over the weekend. And uh, so, you know, go through this knowing that you might need to change these questions, you might already have the answer to these questions, et cetera. Uh, what I would do is I would, you know, go through these questions uh, with your insurance provider, or your insurance person at the bank, you know what I mean? And so you might just say to CFO here, um, by the way, I'm, I'm feeling like that poll is probably completely done. Uh, yep, uh, it is done. Um, and so 67% of you said the CFO was responsible for insurance, 22% of you said the uh, president was responsible for insurance, and then 11% of you said not sure, and uh, Mike, they already have those results, don't they? So, um, sorry about repeating something you already have, uh, like, it's, like Mike said at the beginning, we're still learning go to webinar. I like the polling aspect of going to a webinar, um, but let's sit down with our CFO in the case of those 67% of the attendees. And, you know, just, just, just as a matter of saying, we don't need to answer this question or asking this question. Um, you know, I mean, it really might get down here to the data coverages. So hopefully your CFO or your president or whoever will know the answers to most of these questions because what we don't want to do is we don't want to send our insurance provider, you know, um, 50 questions, right? We want to try to whittle those down. If, if we need, if we, if we can't whittle them down, uh, well, then let's have a meeting with our insurance provider and try to walk through them. And you'll find that most of them the insurance provider can answer, but in many cases they'll need to go to the drawing board and kind of look up the answers to the questions. Um, and then what I would do is, is, well, first of all, we should probably freeze this frame up here so that we keep the headings. Uh, so forgive me while I do that. Um, but what I would do is as you're talking to the insurance provider or as you're getting the answers back, I document where it is in the policy. 
Because if you can have that documentation, if this can be a tool that's available to your incident response team, uh, it'll make it easier for you when you actually get to an incident and, and get into the response uh, phase of an incident. Um, if you can document that, hey, we definitely need to uh, talk about this because they don't have this in place. And, and boy, though, if once we're in an incident, the likelihood of that causing a problem is a seven. And man, you know, the, the, you know, the impact of it is really high compared to this question over here where, you know, who really cares even if the impact is high? it ends up being low risk. Well, now we can go ahead and make sure that we ask this question or that we go back to the CFO saying, we want this particular coverage. And, you know, to make you feel better about the fact that we thought this through, we don't need this coverage because it's low risk as opposed to this high risk coverage. So I'm hoping you all been around risk management and risk analysis enough to know that you can use risk assessing to help prioritize um, it also helps you lay the paper trail, not only for your auditors and exam examiners, but in the case of an incident, you want to be able to show to the media, to your uh, customers, to your the, the lawyers representing your customers, that the reason you didn't have coverage for that XYZ issue is because it just represented low risk at the time that you considered it, and here's your paper trail proving that. So I'm hoping that you find uh, this document to be useful. Uh, for those of you who are close clients of ours, uh, please let us know what's missing from this. You know, please let us know, you know, where you think we might have missed the mark on this document. Like I said, it's our first iteration, uh, but I think it does, you know, serve well uh, to at least help you get started on the process of knowing what questions to ask. Uh, Mike, were there any questions that came up in the webinar? Uh, no, uh, nothing uh, relating to material, Dan. Okay, great. Uh, well, how about we go ahead and continue this with the um, the concluding section. I appreciate everybody's help. I think I'm going to go ahead and let Mike take over the next part of this, other than I'm the guy that moves the uh, uh, slides forward, so I, I can't fall asleep during this part. Uh, but <laughs> go for it, Mike. Thanks, Dan. All right, so thank you guys so much. Uh, we will be sending an evaluation survey, just a quick survey. It takes about a minute, maybe two. Um, I think it's five questions. And we'd really appreciate your feedback to let, you, to let us know how we're doing. Um, also, we have, uh, I have drawn for the winner of the SOC 2, uh, uh, SOC 1 or SOC 2 review. Uh, so I will let that winner know via, via email. And um, I think that concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you, Dan. Well, you're welcome, Mike. And I uh, think I'll finish up by putting on more music from our favorite artist at Infotex, Michael Kelsey. Thanks, everybody, for attending our webinar. Thank you. When you view an Infotex webinar or movie, you do so with four caveats. First, you're agreeing to the terms posted at the web page listed on this slide. Second, our lawyers want you to know that what Infotex presents is often time dated or about new trends, regulations, or guidance, and therefore we cannot provide this material with any warranty whatsoever. Thirdly, material provided with Infotex webinars and movies is copyrighted. You keep the copyright to material customized to your organization, but Infotex reserves the right to use the material in other engagements and boilerplates. See our transfer of copyright agreement at the webpage listed in this slide. Finally, those who view our webinars or movies may be added to an email mailing list. If you do not wish to receive notice of additional educational opportunities, please accept our apologies and please opt out at the web page shown on this slide.